All right, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. And uh, we've got the FSI crew back. It is good to see you. We got some new faces like Jason. Got uh, It's good to see everybody. Kurt, we got Adrian back. First time in a long time. That's fun. How is everybody? I think we need more epic entrances instead of just the screen kind of appearing. I feel like we should like have a dropping out of the sky like an Avenger or yeah. something like that and landing. We should repel in. There you go. Something like that. <laughs> you first. No. <laughs> Some and I meant James. <laughs> All right. Uh this is this is fun. It's good to see everybody. Somebody uh so humunculus, humunculus huh? That's the the little man in the brain, the little pocket one. I was looking at that comment. Hum humunculus Kevin, little little guitar playing Kevin in the brain. Oh no, I just got signed out of restream. I hope we're still going. We should be. Yeah, we are. Okay. It's weird. Restream just signs out weird like this sometime. So last time we came together, we have we have a little fewer people this time. Somebody commented and said that uh, Layton's over there talking about unelect infants or something like that. So maybe some people are watching that. That's that's fine because we're here to do this. So last time we were here, we talked about Derek Webb. And we were watching a video where he's commenting. Somebody commented and they're like, Why are you why are you playing videos of Derek Webb and talking about that? Isn't he some kind of woke anti Christian and blah blah blah? And it's obviously somebody who had not watched the video because that's that's actually kind of the point is to as a group toggle with something that is kind of difficult, that is not cut and dry, that is not black and white, that's not free cookie cutter ordained for us i mean that's kind of the point of what he was saying is be able to use discernment uh to suss out what a christian can glean from something that cannot be called christian in any real way other than a marketing term <laughs> in including Point. somebody else does anybody have any comments before we get going and uh listen to this video or are we ready to go I'm good either way. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, in what you were saying, like in summary of that, somebody making a comment like that almost goes to show one of the things we brought out last week, which was that there's this, there seems to be this phenomenon with as Christians approach any kind of content that there's this default position as if there's going to it's going to be strictly from this really super rigid and stagnant religious perspective so that comment it's like you they, they didn't watch the video mm -hmm. that's right they didn't watch the video they just came at it with their default position and just just kind of espoused information stemming from that default position uh, like almost assuming that we were going to hack down uh Derek Webb's wokeism or leftism or liberalism or whatever because right. it's a quote christian channel and then when they don't hear that kind of uh presumed content coming out of what we're doing if we're not denouncing him yeah yeah, it's kind of like, well, what are these people doing? Like, why, what's the point of this? What's the point of what they're doing if they're not going to just pander to the ideology? Yeah. That's essentially what happens with the Alistair Baggs thing, right? The, the community wanted him to instantly say, oh, this is wrong. And you have to, well, what he was talking about, you have to live in that space. Yes. That's such a great way to say it. You have to, that's right. That's what, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We're living in the present tense space. That's what we're trying to do. I think Kyle just put his hand up. Yeah. A comment like that strikes me as very static. Like uh, once you're in a category, there's no movement. 
like the expectation is, oh, I've been able to identify mm -hmm. a guy named Derek Webb and I know what he is. I'm going to keep him there because it's easy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so Derek Webb's not allowed to be a dynamic character. No. Yeah, he, there's we've, there's not pre-classified him already. There's not grace enough to offer him opportunity to move out of the category I've identified him to be in. Um, that's that's a it's a really interesting way to go through the world. Um, whoever made that comment, I hope they're watching tonight and like consider they've probably not been their best at a point in their own life. And uh, if they were classified by that not greatest moment, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't seem um, like the right move to uh, hold whatever Derek Webb's done over his head continually forever. Um, maybe give him an opportunity to right the ship a little bit. I don't know. Just so, the, yeah, the, the way you said that makes me think of rule omega outside of just one interaction. Right. You're going to mm -hmm. rule omega in an entire circumstance. What's what's the opposite of myopic, Jason? Hyperopic. <laughs> Hyperopic. Yeah. To uh to so instead of being so zoomed in on one particular thing to kind of zoom instead of using rule omega just in one interaction, I'm going to rule omega somebody's entire decade of a process of whatever they're going through yeah it's it's derek webb the river not derek webb the cup i took from the river that's yeah that's a really good way to say it and then uh kurt and then we'll and then we'll uh listen to a segment and see how that goes yeah it's just it's interesting because with with derek webb obviously he's saying he denounced the faith and walked away from it and everything and th this is something that happens right so what what is wrong with kind of analyzing it look at look at the reasoning that he has for it um and then kind of come to some solution about it or just a conclusion and understand that maybe you can help people otherwise maybe there's a good reason for him leaving the faith and all that and then i just think that's what we're analyzing so it's dogmatically just going oh we need to denounce him i don't see that as helpful yeah, it's like which which faith did he leave? You know, it's like it's another another question that uh, you know, just because you think you know and he thinks he knows doesn't mean you're saying the same thing. Maybe That's he left that, a yeah. stage of faith and not not like a uh, you know like a. Uh, I think that's exactly what was happening. He was yeah. leaving a stage of faith, not an actual religion. And he just did not have the vocabulary to put with it. Right. Probably the same thing with Tyler Vela. Something I heard several years ago, somebody say that Christians were the only, like God's army was the only one that had been edited. Some of them. What was that, Jim? So that the Lord's army was the only one that bayonets its own wounded. Yeah. <laughs> Fratricide. There, hmm. there is a gleeful delight sometimes with people when they watch this happen. Mm. Um. Yeah, when I got divorced, my longtime independent Baptist buddy, he he's like, "Oh, you done messed up now." That's the first thing he said to me. Not, "Are you hurting? Are you? Can you do you need any help?" Nothing like that. Um, I was gonna say something based on what Kurt said, and it left me. So maybe it's not that important. So, well, yeah. Um, so what I was going to say was that Christ is a way, is the way. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We talk about this all the time on the channel. To me, we, you know, last week we talked about this concept of being left of bang. Hmm. All the people who are ideological Christians, Christians, and I'm not saying they're not saved and on their way to hell, but like whether they're Calvinists or provisionists or Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, they're, they're all idiot. It's all propositionally normative Christians. It's not, they're not following the way that is Christ. They're following a set of propositions 
erected in place of Christ. And so I don't think, I mean, those, I don't consider those people to be following the way that is Christ anyway, as I don't think Derek Webb left anything. Makes sense. That's, maybe it's a horrible thing to say about all the rest of the people. <laughs> When, what everyone sees as leaving and what he had no other words to describe as then leaving, I think is actually finally uh, starting of a, of a wake up uh, of some sorts. Anyway, let's get to uh, this in the lower left hand side. I have the or- lower left hand side of the video. I have the original video in case people want to go watch the whole thing. And also I have the mouse on the tracker on the scrubber so that you can see how much time has elapsed in the original which is different than the one that we're looking at here just just for transparency's sake in case anybody wants to go look at that so uh without further ado as james white would say i'll play this for a little bit and then we'll stop it and see what kind of comments we have it's just yeah. music just like everything else and um and it's not uh, inherently right true good beautiful it's not yeah. it's just not it's made by people who are attempting to who communicate maybe, those things that's or right to plug into that who maybe see the world that way right yeah but that doesn't mean that their content is right true good beautiful saved redeemed inherently it's not mm-hmm. it doesn't and so you know that was always problematic for us we never really loved that and once you get stuck with that, it's really hard to shake it. Yeah. And so I wound up, even through my solo career, kind of identified really strongly um, with kind of that ca- that Christian music category. And mm-hmm. some of the time, because it is, it has over my life been part of how I see the world. It's certainly sure. been part of my practice or belief at different times in my life. And so I didn't really mind it. I didn't think it was um, misleading. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the last, let's say, five, six, seven years, I don't find myself identifying as a evangelical Christian believer anymore. Mm-hmm. I just don't. Um, and so, but part of being an artist and part of um, um, identifying strongly with a, with a particular group of folks mm-hmm. and providing soundtrack for people's lives um, is trying to discern what it is that they value and appreciate and resonate with about, about you as an artist or about yeah. me. And so for me, I feel like I'm at my real strength when I'm poking at and talking about and engaging and pulling apart um, kind of spirituality. I think that's mm. like been a thing I've been really comfortable doing. I really like doing, even though I'm not really, a, I, I would not say a Christian anymore as people would really sure. understand that. I realized that, you know, it's been such a big part of my life. And so many of the people who've been with me since the early Cademan's day, so that's been mm-hmm. 20 years. Yeah, That's still some, they are still somewhere on that trajectory. And so I thought, you know what? Why would I run from this? Why not go ahead and, um, and that's where I kind of came up with the idea for the Jesus hypothesis, mm-hmm. which is the new record, which is just me saying, you know what? I'm uncertain permanently about all this stuff. Yeah. I think when you're dealing with invisible, unknowable things, invisible like God, unknowable like the future, which inarguably those two things are, I don't think even Christians Correct. would argue that, that God is invisible and the future is unknowable. Yeah. Um, I think uncertainty is a good way to go. And so I'm going to approach it less like, trying to prove something I think is true with a confirmation bias and say, you know what, mm. let's just kind of hypothesize and say, May- maybe, maybe Jesus is all the things that people say, maybe he's not, but he's still something and he's still meaningful and still, yeah. but let's hypothesize about it. Let's hypothesize in real time. Let's try it on. Let's see how it feels. That's what this new record is. And that line um, is from the title track. And it's basically saying, yeah, what you know, what you, you quoted there, but you know, maybe black sheep aren't lost; they're just pioneers. So it's like mm-hmm. when you think about the people who've been important to the kind of Christian spiritual narrative over the whole story. Mm-hmm. Initially, they're seen as totally crazy, yeah, crazy heretics, and, heretics yeah. immediately, until in hindsight, they're seen as the pioneers or the faithful or the people who were on the narrow road and the people on the narrow road always look crazy to the people on the broad road. And the majority of the people who are in the thing are on the broad road. You know, that was always, that was Jesus' whole problem actually. (laughs) Um, Everybody he was talking to and all the church leaders that had such a hard time with him, they were on, they were broad road people and he was a narrow road guy. And so anyways, it's like, that was, that's, that's part of the, what lit the fuse on this new record was looking at, you know what? 
like, and even some, some people who I either like or read or know personally, mm -hmm. guys like Richard Rohr or Rob Bell or people yeah. who are kind of the thorn in the side of a lot of the evangelical Christian mm -hmm. world, maybe these guys are just the people brave enough to call into question things that need to be questioned. And it's happened all through the church's history. Of course. You think of, um, think what you will about Martin Luther. He was a complicated guy, but if you're not a Roman Catholic, if you're a Christian and a not and, 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 and a Protestant, he's your church father. Yeah, he was excommunicated. He, they tried to take his head off. Um, talk about a black sheep. And talk about a black sheep. And he was seen as a total insane heretic. He mm -hmm. was just trying to be a good Catholic. He was trying yeah. to. You know, the church was corrupt. He was like, we're better than this. We can't be like this. And he was like trying mm -hmm. to call him back to faithfulness or whatever. They saw him. They they thought he was crazy. They excommunicated him. Tried to kill him. Next thing you know, he goes from a reform or trying to reform the church he loved to a Protestant protesting against the church that wouldn't yeah. reform. And and now he looks. Now we all appreciate that. I right. guess. Yeah. But at the time, he looked crazy. A lot, a lot in there. Um, I, was I was struck when he said he's no longer a Christian. It's, I'm going to misquote this. I'm no longer a Christian as people would define it. As people would understand that. I wrote that down oh, too. Okay. As um, people would understand that. I would like to know how he views himself because it sounds like he's just in seeking mode at this point and has really not landed anywhere in particular so later in the video he mentions reading this book i forget what the title of the book is but he's he mentions reading this book and he's like well if this guy's a christian he if he still identifies as a christian and can talk this way maybe i can too so i and i haven't read that book i can't even remember the title of it right now but um i think that's very interesting but i have share that question with you like okay not a christian as people would understand it because I've often felt like I've often felt the urge to kind of make an, some kind of announcement myself because I know what people think when the term Christian gets said and I'm not that but I am following Christ so I don't know how to distinguish my att my current attempt to follow the way that is Christ versus my previous version of Christianity which was propositional idolatry um I don't know how to distinguish that for people who don't have, you know, two to three years of the vocabulary build up that, that I've waded through to try to figure out what's going on with me. If that makes sense. It does to me. I, I find myself and, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but it's true. Sometimes I'm embarrassed to say, or to align myself with Christianity because of what I hear and read and see people doing to each other, particularly online, because you're relatively anonymous and anything goes. But it's just like when when I hear some things come out of the pens computer of professing Christians, I'm I'm just almost embarrassed to to align myself with that, and I yeah, feel like badly. I'm not with them. About, right, right. Anybody ever been with a significant other and uh, maybe you've just been dating a month or two and you're like, I don't really enjoy being around them in a social setting. I don't, I don't want to have to claim them to the people I know. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way about other Christians. I don't have a problem with the Jesus Christ that I understand, but I do have a problem with the one that they understand. That kind of circles back to what he was saying about the music, right? With the Christian label, we're, as followers of Christ, we're, we're bearing that. And that attachment of, of Christ has different meaning to different people, depending on their experiences and what they've encountered. And so you're dealing with all that baggage, whether that be uh, for most people where that's good baggage, that they, they are Christians, they have a positive association with it. If they're not, there could be a lot of negativity to deal with there. Mm -hmm. It's like with um, with atheism, a com common thing I might say if I'm speaking with somebody who's an atheist, I'll get them to describe their idea of God. And then I say, you know what? I actually agree with you. I, I don't believe in that God either. Mm -hmm. So what you just described is not is not the concept of God. So what people aren't believing in is they're, they're right in a way. I totally agree with that.
Yeah, I've 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 said the exact same thing to people many times. Yeah, I, I joined the atheists in their rejection of the uh, the idol of God that people are following these days. You know, him as an artist, I have to also wonder what kind of influence was coming at him in terms of like his creative side, his creative spirit. And I have to imagine that when you're with a label, with a group like that, when you're in the Christian circles, when you've been, I think his word is ID'd with evangelist, evangelical Christian believers. That Wait, Say that last part again. The Well, when he said, he said ID'd with evangelical Christian believers. I think that was well right along with what Roberta said with uh, Christians as people would understand it. Yeah. He was stepping away. That was his first thing. Kind of, he said, I, I don't ID with, I don't identify with Christian. Okay, identify. That's, Christian. I was struggling with that. Sorry, I did an <laughs> abbreviation here in my writing. My bad. But I have to imagine like in his career as they're working, like for a record label producing stuff, that there was probably restrictions and things there too in terms of where you could go create, you know, in terms of create creativity like what he was trying to express. Like when somebody's artistic like that, they try to express through different, uh, through different means. Yeah. It sounds like the, the, um, the record label kind of pigeonholed them as Christian. And at the time they were just trying to be artists and they're like, well, we, we are Christian. So I guess we're okay with that. Something like that. You're talking about back in the original Caveman's no, Call days? Well, no, even probably even more recently. Like I would think like if you're releasing if you're releasing music that is intended to ultimately go out and be played in churches, you're gonna have people that are gonna be picking apart the lyrics in such a way that it is most presentable to the most amount of churches, so it brings mm -hmm. back the most amount of so they can market it. Yep. Yeah. It also yeah. makes me think of like uh I can't go to get away from this image of the freedom, like uh, Paul says in uh, I think Second Timothy that the word of God is unbound, basically and free. And while Paul is writing the all of the letters, I I can't imagine that um, he 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 knows what he's writing to be quote unquote scripture. You know, because whenever he says the word scripture in his letters, he's referring to the Old Testament, not to his own writings. And it's as if, you know, you fast forward 2000 years later and anything that comes out of the mouth of the of a Christian needs to ultimately have its uh, source and or reference from scripture. And so. There is no freedom for the word of God to uh, extemporaneously come out in some way, you know. Um, so I kind of feel like what John was saying there in terms of the inherent expectations and or regulations that may have been put around the creative um cultivation of his music his lyrics whatever i kind of think if you take that into you know if you just kind of use paul as an analogy it's like we would have nothing from paul but could you imagine like peter you know looking at paul's letters and being like oh no no i i spent time with jesus and th this is not what he would have said this is not the way it is or you know something like that some other christian beating down or putting kind of expectations and regulations and creative constraints on Paul's freedom of speech. You know, it's almost, it almost feels like freedom of expression or freedom of speech is so, so, so deeply linked to the word of God. And I don't mean the word of God is scripture. Cause I don't think that those two things are the same thing. I don't think, scripture um i don't think the word of god is is tied down to scripture if that makes sense i think scripture is is the word of god but i don't think that it's bound it's simply merely bound to that 
you know, at least that's not the way that I see it in the Bible. Like Paul says in second Timothy two, uh, two 15, um, to rightly discern the word of truth. Um, you know, and I just, when you say that i totally agree with it but my mind is racing on how to frame it in a way that a fundamentalist wouldn't balk at it yeah well and if i, I take guess, a step yeah go for it well so the bible has only so much in it like the the paper with writing on it and sometimes we think that they're like it's all that ever happened, but notice like it doesn't, it doesn't record every meal ever taken together. Like they probably talked at that meal that wasn't recorded in scripture and things were probably said of value. Now we don't have access to that information. Um, if Christ is, is God, which I believe he is, and he said something, which it's his word. Be the word of God. We're missing some of it. Now, um, you know, when I pray, um, there have been times where I feel like God's answered me. Now, that's not written down in scripture. Um, but I have scripture to look at to help discern if what I think is going on is legit or, or is reliable to believe is legit. You know, like, does God work this way? Is his character such that, that this makes sense? Is, is this wisdom? I can ask for clarification. I can ask for confirmation. I can do a lot of things, um, all of which aren't on the paper. And I, I think, I think it, if we assume that God's word is only on the paper, well, then why are we asking for answers to prayer? Like, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. The Bible itself talks about uh, conscience and nature be having signal from God in them. I kind of look at the Bible like a record of patterns and I feel like now this is just my my perspective. I feel like the patterns are finite, but the patterns can be made manifest infinitely throughout time, throughout culture. And so I feel like we go to the scripture to see um you know, this is the pattern of how God operates. This is the pattern of, you know, how he thinks. This is the pattern of how certain situations play out. And then you can see that pattern manifest in real life in diverse manners in a multitude of ways. So that's why I feel like it's, the word of God is not limited to scripture because we can see a manifestation of the pattern that's not written in scripture. But at the same time, the scripture is where we go to to identify the pattern, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. If I, if I could try and fuse together um, how Kyle and Adrian beautifully, um, you know, kind of made the, this, this important distinction that I'm trying to that I'm trying to make. I think that when we look at how the word of how scripture describes the word of God in kind of like the most ultimate and dynamic sense. Scripture calls the word of God basically a person. And it, it's almost like, and it likens that person unto um, God himself. I'm just thinking of, you know, John 1. Uh, it likens the word, the person to God himself and also as almost consciousness like a conscious conscious light um he is the uh the light that bringeth light uh to every man you know um so when i think of how scripture describes the word or the word of god 
it seems to coalesce or come together in a in a much more dynamic way in the form of personhood or agency um ultimate agency and his the the name is Jesus you know um i think that's that sounds more along the lines of what the entire gospel of john is getting at when it's talking about this um in a philosophical or spiritual sense that that seems more right right on to me um and then even even bring it all the way to the end of the book or to the end of the whole entire book when uh when the word of god comes back in like revelation uh 19 it comes back as the word of god faithful and true and it's not a page it's not a book that's coming back it's a person it's a it's an agent a powerful agent um so yeah i think there's so many facets to the notion of the word of god that we can't make the grave mistake of thinking that it's bound up into the um, limited bandwidth of our narcissistic uh, English, the, the narcissism of the English language, you know, like the, the, that it would be bound up in just the language of the person who is, you know, uh is hearing it. it does that make sense you know it it just seems so limiting so um also like the patterns when jesus says to him that hath shall it be given that's uh joe rogan is going to get the most podcast opportunities because he has the most podcast recognizability. You see that that kind of patterns. He's not I always heard Jesus' statements like that as um these rules that God has, but really they're um he's trying to tell you how the world works. Yeah, the way it is. And then when you look at yeah, he's trying to tell you what's going on. You look at uh Joseph, Jesus, you can't help but, you know, hero with a thousand faces. Like Joseph Campbell You've got Pinocchio, Star Wars, Lion King, Little Mermaid. You see this same kind of pattern over and over. And you start to recognize that pattern is like there's a there's like an undercurrent of through line that you can detect and tie back to scripture. I'm trying to find I got Ruckman's reference Bible right here, and he's got one of the appendices in the back, which lists 33 plots, 33 like narrative plots that are in the Bible. And uh, he says that every movie and every book that does well is one of these 33 plots, maybe slightly modified, but is basically one of these 33 plots. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of interesting. But anyway, the, the pattern that the, you can see it, you can, once you get a flow for how maybe something like water, like once you learn how water works, it doesn't matter if you're getting the water in a river or in the Gulf of Mexico, you understand how water works in different environments and you understand the flow of it and the pattern of it. And if it gets too cold, it'll freeze. And if it acts this way, you can get a wave and there's an undercurrent. You, know, you learn these things about the pattern of how it moves. And then knowing just... Ruckman, it's probably a double, there's a double, probably a double meta pattern, which Ver which solidifies and verifies his 33 patterns because there's 33 patterns and there were 33 years in the life of Christ, thus making this meta pattern to the patterns and ma making his 33 patterns <laughs> the best 33, the best pattern. <laughs> well, I haven't, I haven't examined the 33 very closely, but somebody said that he actually got the list from a Russian guy who had discovered 31 of them. And then he added Maybe he added two to make it 33. <laughs> you know how he was with numerology. So I think kind of a, maybe an analogy that just came to mind, speaking of this in the Bible. So if you look at 
your reality and experience and reality, what's happening in the world, if you looked at that as sort of like a cryptogram, and then you look at the Bible as kind of the, the codex, a little clue. So you can, you oh. can, you know, the letter is uh, this equals A, and then you start decoding it. And so you kind of refer to the Bible as sort of that thing that, so it doesn't have all the content. The, the mystery of life. Yeah, it doesn't have all the content. It has the kind of like a key. Mm -hmm. It was amazing the because you had said to me, Kevin, I, I don't remember exactly what we were talking about. Um, you had talked about how condensed. Mm -hmm. I think we were talking about the Gospels. But that really struck me because when I was starting to read the Bible, I thought, wow, yes, it just goes from this scene to this scene to this scene. And there's a whole bunch missing in between. Mm -hmm. And it's like taking a three minute cut out of a two hour video. There's so much more there that, you know, has happened, but you don't see it. And I, you know, Nick talking about the scripture being unbounded and i think that is so freeing for us as christians mm -hmm. because if we lived our life unbounded in our christian walk and on that the path of the way we would fill in the blanks of those pages with our own lives because it's the same christ that's living in us and the patterns will be repeated and we will see a lot of what's missing, I think, in between those scenes in the Bible, because he wants to know us and we want to know him. And I just I, I just see something there that we as Christians miss out on by, by not really living with him, next to him all the time. I mean, it just goes back to what Jordan Peterson said, and I've actually thought before I even heard it, that what would we be like if we really believed? I mean, really, really believed. Mm -hmm. I think we'd be very different. And I think that we would be able to fill in those pages for ourselves and our lives. Some of what we're talking about now uh, made me, when I watched the video, want to kind of push back a little about, uh, from what David said about, you know, even Christians would agree it's unknowable and God is invisible. We're talking about, mm -hmm. okay, like, like, you know, scripture being like the crypto key to interpret life and with and, and how to live. It's like, okay, the better you recognize patterns, I mean, that's largely how our brains work, right? You can't possibly experience everything, but you, right. you, you learn a few things and your brain and you realize like, wait, this has great generalizability. And yes. Jesus in the scripture even got 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 on the Jews because he's like you can read the clouds but you can't read the sign of the times. He was saying reading the signs of the times should be easier to do them than than reading the weather, and that implies that the more we grow in relationship with mm. Him, the more yeah. we should be able to predict the future. And that's not to say we're not God. We're not going to have it one hundred percent accuracy, but we should be able to predict really well, just like the humans we're close to, those that are, we really love, and close friends and family. Because we know them so well, we can, with fairly good accuracy, predict what they're going to do and how they're going to behave in certain situations. And the same thing is true with the, the God's in, uh, invisibility. You know, I've heard this, the first time I heard this principle was they used Abraham Lincoln as an example. Anything that's historic is uh, unknowable if you don't want to, all, all you can do is present evidence. You can't see Abraham Lincoln. I can present more and more evidence to you as to his existence and what he did and who he was, but I can't prove it to you. And if we truly believe that Jesus was a manifestation of God, then he certainly wasn't invisible, right? Is he standing in front of me here now? No, but neither is Abraham Lincoln, right? So I thought there's a little bit of pushback against the the unknowable and the invisible. So like I, that, yeah, I think that some of that stuff is knowing about, like we can know about mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln, but we can't really know what it's like to participatorily know him in relationship. And True. so when, it, so when it comes to Jesus, I think if I were to modify Derek Webb's statements, it would be something like 
the degree to which God is knowable becomes more and more subjective. So in other words, so there's not like any conventional means by which we test and validate data or reality that mm -hmm. is sufficient to, to validate whether or not somebody's claim to know Jesus is real. Now, doesn't Acts 17, I want to say Acts 17, address the unknowable God? And Paul actually... The unknown God. The unknown God. I think, I think, I take Paul's words there to be that he was unknown to them, not unknown to him, not unknowable. That would be agnosticism. Hmm. I want to add on to what Jason said, because I love every single point that he made because one thing I did notice when I was listening to Derek Webb is that I feel like he tried to broaden the scope of mystery and broaden the scope of uncertainty mm -hmm. and I feel like honestly <laughs> I feel like in some ways he's still a Calvinist because part of being a Calvinist is not necessarily the belief system itself, but the faulty thought processes that lead you to buying into the belief system. And there are several points that I notice. oh, Calvinists have that same faulty thought process that he's espousing right now. And one of them was broadening the scope of mystery, right? So when you talk to a oh. Calvinist, and you point out the flaw in their logic or you point out how their theology, you know, contradicts scripture, then all of a sudden, you know, oh, the mysteries of God, the unsearchable riches of his, you know, and so they like to broaden the scope of mystery. And I feel like he kind of did the same thing. And that bothered me because to Jason's points, like when you know a person, you can't necessarily predict the future, but you have a general idea of how things are going to play out. Like if someone comes to you and says, oh, your spouse said such and such, and you know that person, you're like, I, they didn't say that. I know they didn't say that. Or you believe that they said it based on the knowledge that you have of the person. And so I agree with Jason's pushback, and I'm pushing back to that. He, he made God more mysterious, and he made things more uncertain than I believe they actually are. And like I said, that just goes back to, I, I feel like he still has the faulty thought processes that made him a Calvinist in the first place. And I noticed it in other areas too, but I don't want to take up too much time. Yeah. I want, that's, that's a really interesting point. Cause you're the, you're the second person to say that. Um, oh. John, he, John's not here this week. He was on last week. John MC, he, he did not know that Derek had been a Calvinist. Cause he had just wasn't familiar with him, but mm -hmm. he detected that he was just from listening to this video or portions of it. He didn't even listen to the whole thing. So I thought that was very interesting to pick that up. I do think that there's like, when it comes to certainty and uncertainty, there's, there's a difference between having the humility of realizing what is what you do and don't know, like in an epistemically sound way, the humility and the wisdom of not knowing versus using mystery as a lever to justify accepting a contradiction. Like I am living in cognitive dissonance. Well, I'm going to bring mystery in to alleviate that or at least in their mind. Yeah. I, when I, I listen think, to yeah, talk, go ahead. when I listen to him talk, he sound like someone who didn't know God, like experientially participatorily and so he's leaning on mystery and uncertainty um, as a cop out for the fact that I have good reason to believe in God, but I don't know him. And so I'm going to make him more mysterious than he actually is. I'm going to make things more uncertain than they actually are. Hmm. It's hard to know what you don't know. So like if he never experienced God. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt that, like, him him making him more, um, like, he's God's just mysterious and he's always been, um. So, like, I, I almost want to say hallelujah. He's, he's moving, and still interested. 
like there's a I don't know how how much of an environment with no actual contact with God. I mean, he he'd been in the industry for a long time, kind of going through what might have been the motions mentally, like going through the this this is this is what the group um seems to be doing. I'm doing it too. The fact that he's even sitting down with somebody talking about God, talking about um, where he is now, what he's looking at, like reading books on the subject. Um, in, instead of, instead of ripping him, we should be praying for him. Um, in my opinion. Amen. So I think Kyle, I think I resonate a little bit more with what Kyle's getting at. I do think that I think Adrian is correct though in that analysis where you hear in Derek Webb's language or at least not not necessarily the language but the actual thought process of how one would in his prior paradigm come to know God in this m more you know the uh, ontological deductive argument oh and now I believe in God because of you know, uh, William Lane Craig's Kalam cosmological argument or, um, you know, a uh, some sort of, uh, you know, cla classical theists um, little proposition set of, you know, logical reasoning. You can see, like, the residual um, technique of this is how someone would come to know God. And you see him explain that pattern and withdraw from it, saying, I'm actually now in this uncertainty space, and I'm becoming comfortable in this uncertainty space where I don't have proposition sets or um, deductive... Explan or I don't have explanatory power for some sort of... Uh... Uh, model of ontology something like yes that. yes and so I'm, I'm not relying on like a deductive syllogism in order to persuade me or draw me towards some sort of ideological commitment and so this is where i resonate a little bit more with kyle where it seems to me where i could see how those residual patterns of thinking were there but there's also this withdrawal from them, and it seems like in that un in that uncertainty space that he's moving around in, what I see is him grasping for, or at least searching for some maybe some new language, um, some new mm -hmm. new ways of potentially piecing together other ways of structuring his own epistemic. Power. Yeah, like so you need like to have if, a certain vocabulary that serves as real estate where new new ways of knowing can live. Ex exactly what I'm trying to say. And that real estate isn't there. Exactly. It, 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 exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to say. It's like, so if you were to give him like an explanation of maybe the four types of knowing and then maybe a little bit of a new cognitive grammar scheme, some here's in so and, here's the four ways of knowing. Yeah, that's exactly what we're epistemic. trying to do on the channel that frustrates me with some of the people who push against it is like, if you get what we're saying, you won't have to become like Derek Webb when you have your bang moment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's and so the point. that's that's what I yeah, that that's exactly to help I think you recognize this, you don't have to leave Christ when you have this crisis moment. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of us. Um, that are right in the same similar sort of pocket that Derek Derek Webb is in, where we see the problems with not just the content of our previous ideological paradigms, but as we as we detach from that the content, we can struggle a little bit to not adopt the same patterns of thinking. Um. And just kind of replacing like 
the you know the content like which is what i think provisionism is really doing with calvinism is it's they've detached from the content but all of the patterns all the patterns are still there thinking yep. are still there and they yeah. just grasp onto new content instead of moving into a space of true liminality and uncertainty to where they have to actually restructure the entirety of their epistemic program and then after that epistemic landscape is maybe cultivated, like with something like the four types of knowing, then you can start building up a um, a, a cognitive grammar. Yeah, scheme. you have like a you start again with a real tight custodianship of propositions to the other three kinds of knowing, making sure there is a good one for one match for everything that is said. And we're mm -hmm. not allowed to just throw words out there that don't have a good anchor point. Yes. And that's one of like, I mean, we've been saying this on the channel for years at this point. One of the most important things you can do when you are awakening or at least coming into a into a new space is slow down your speech and pay attention to your language. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that we, we did that with the uh, the scripture versus the word of God, um, little thing. And you can see that, you know, there will be people that struggle with that because they haven't, they haven't had the, uh, the time to detach from the paradigm and cultivate a new set of epistemic processes. And, and then also, you know, a, a, a cognitive grammar scheme to go along with that that step epistemic process. So I want to, I want to say two things before we get to, um, well, in case somebody else wants to jump on that, but um, when we talk about anchor points, I want to give you a little visual aid here. Imagine you're, there's a, a spot of land that has a lot of landmarks on it and it's covered with clouds. And we have a lot of hot air balloons that are above the clouds, but each hot air balloon has a anchor point that reached down to a landmark that keeps it in place so that all the hot air balloons accurately represent the landmarks and the proportion between them and the distance between them, even as the wind sways them around, right? So they, they maintain that. Well, Calvinism and provisionism, you have all hot air balloons, but you don't have any anchor points. You just cut all those off. You're still above the clouds and you rearrange all the balloons in a way that makes sense. So it's logical. It has order. It makes sense. It's a system. But none of those have any anchor points. None of them reflect the shape of the actual landmarks anymore. So if you were to use them as a map, you would be all discombobulated when you got down to the land and like, oh, Denmark was over here, but now it's over here. It doesn't make any sense. And so if, if propositions, propositions are these air balloons. And we and the other three kinds of knowing are the landmarks and our inability to see the supernatural or the transcendent or whatever it is you want to call it. That's the clouds separating us from there. So we have to be very careful that our propositions, the air balloons are properly anchored to what they're supposed to represent. And all the systems that we have, like Calvinism and provisionism, there are no anchor points and they're just they're just jostling these things around like Scrabble letters into some way that they spell something and make some kind of sense, but they're not pointing at anything anymore. They're not anchored to anything real anymore. They, they lost their capacity to serve as a map. So I want to make that point first. The next thing I want to say is pulling together what Adrian and Roberta and several people said with regard to scripture, having a lot of information and serving as a guide and maybe showing patterns but it's not exhaustive. Somebody in the comments said the word inerrancy, okay? Well, there's a bonded triad of necessity, sufficiency, and comprehensiveness. So the Bible is necessary. You could say it's sufficient because uh, 1 Timothy 3, the 2 Timothy 3, 16, that the word of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. So it, it can provoke a person to all good works, but it is not comprehensive. It does not tell you what size wrench to use on the lug nuts on your car, you know, but, it, but there is enough information to prompt you to realize that that's important. <laughs> Something like that. So I think the bonded triad comes in necessity, sufficiency, and comprehensive is more helpful to me than 
some word like inerrancy because somebody else said actually divine dissonance said uh, inerrancy you we can't say that for our um english translations well we actually also can't say that for any of the manuscripts we have either because they don't match the manuscripts don't match so we can believe in the make believe inerrancy of some manuscripts that existed long ago and far away, which nobody alive today has ever seen, and which have never been compiled together in a book anywhere. Or we can work with what we have. And I think I think the necessary and sufficient but not comprehensive is that bonded triad comes in and helps, in my opinion. Do you mind if I clear something up from when I followed Adrian? Yeah. I, I need to own something. So it could have been understood that i was calling what air uh, adrian said as making fun of Derek webb i was thinking in my head the comment that kevin referenced early in the in the channel so adrian if you felt like i was coming at you i really wasn't i i had a <laughs> moment where i was thinking of the individual kevin mentioned from the first video comments and I realize now how that may have sounded. And I just wanted to own and clear the air. Uh, that's not definitely not what I was getting at. There was no rivalry between the two of us. Just make, make sure no, we, we knew that. On the contrary, I saw <laughs> I saw I saw like building blocks, you know, uh, as as we progressed through that analysis of Derek Webb's, um, you know, residual patterns and stuff like that. I saw more building blocks than anything. Yeah. I saw you make a distinction between the mystery and the uncertainty. Like you kind of took those two terms that were getting melded together and then pulling them apart and then seeing how they each have their own unique meaning and carry different context. So, yeah. People, tr because speaking publicly as a Christian is seen as some kind of ministry ministries today are viewed by their, they're evaluated by their explanatory power. How much certainty can you give me with your answers? And oftentimes certainty does not come, does not go with growth very well. Uncertainty, like genuine uncertainty, not using it as a tool to evade a contradiction or mystery that way, but genuine uncertainty and recognition of it and epistemic humility, recognizing that and being okay with that, that is where the wisdom gem is. And that's, that's where people actually grow. So the product, where's my little books, the product of what the Calvinists and them are doing is, you know, your systematic theology book, the product of what we are doing is wiser people. The more, the more, Sorry. The the more I, I grow and the more life experience I get, the more I see there's just like this this whole life and the world as God created is like a big object lesson. And what where my mind keeps going with what we're talking about, like you're talking about, like with, with the systems is like you said, you have to have some vocabulary or some framework. And my mind keeps going, going to science. Um, the way we teach science is here's a bunch of facts, memorize them. These are true. And that's not what science is at all. To be doing science, there has to be some unknown, some mystery that you're studying. Like, hey, here's mm -hmm. my hypothesis, and we're going to test to see if this is true. Problem you're and trying so to solve. A, yeah. Exactly. And so there's a disconnect there. We're teaching middle school students like, hey, these are hard facts. When and and like that science, like these facts to memorize. When actually science is in the lives in this realm of the unknown. And that says, science of the process. Taught, yeah. Yeah. I taught chemistry for a couple of years and there's literally uh, in physics, chemistry, something called an uncertainty principle. Like you can't know where an electron Eisenberg's is. uncertainty principle. Yeah, exactly. But if I was going to teach people about the atom, I wouldn't start there. I would start with a model that has a lot of truth and be very certain. But in the end goal is to get them where they understand the uncertainty and where the unknown is. And also but, Gödel's you know, incompleteness theorem mm -hmm. along with Heisenberg's uncertainty theorem. Yeah. But, you, but you, you've got to grow them to the point that they're ready for that. And so when you start off, it sounds very concrete, but you have to be willing to grow past the concrete points. Yeah. Yeah. Adrian, you're going to say something that we got to get to Kurt. Yeah. I feel like I'm seeing a dichotomy that's being created between 
certainty and uncertainty. And I feel like that paradigm isn't, isn't helpful because it's not certainty versus uncertainty. It's about knowing which parts are certain and which parts aren't. And the best way that I would describe that is that, you know, God says he's the beginning and the end. So if you take an apple seed, for example, I know that if I plant that seed, it's going to bring forth an apple tree that's going to produce apples as the fruit, right? So God being the beginning, he provided the seed, right? Because he spoke creation into existence. And then God is the end because the Bible tells us that he's the Lord of the harvest. But the middle part of, you know, when is the harvest going to come forth? How long is it going to take the harvest to come forth? How much money am I going to spend on fertilizer before the tree produces fruit? That's the uncertain part. And that is the, I think, the mysterious element of God that we know that we know what happens with the seed when we plant it and the seed is the beginning and then the fruit is the end. And so I feel like there is certainty there. You know, God says, don't grow weary in your well-doing for in due season, you will reap if you don't faint. So I know if I sow the seed, it's going to bring forth fruit. I just don't know the when, the how, the how long, what is it going to cost me? How frustrated am I going to get in the process? Am I going to give up and abandon the process? And so I kind of almost wish Christians wouldn't have this thought process of I need everything to be uncertain or versus, oh, uncertainty. Let me correct myself. I wish Christians wouldn't have this thought process of I need everything to be certain so I can feel safe versus total certainty is unrealistic. So let's just have unnecessary uncertainty, but realize there's a time and a place where they both exist in the process. Yeah, so you don't want to virtue signal uncertainty. We don't want to make the other mistake on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, like their propositional, our, our paradigmatic folks are overly certain about stuff that makes no sense. And yeah. then we don't want to virtue signal being uncertain to the point where we're uncertain where we don't have to be yeah yeah a adrian i'm really really happy you uh you you brought out that dichotomy because before you said that probably uh, while jason was speaking actually i was thinking in my mind i had this feeling in my body that i feel like we're making a mistake yeah, yeah. here by there's too much there's too much of a sense of the certainty versus uncertainty dichotomy. I'm so happy you brought that out because I was thinking that before you said it and I'm feeling it before you said it. And specifically what I was trying to resolve in my mind was um, because I felt like there was, we were making that dichotomy or at least foregrounding it. I was trying to find the third that would bring um, resolution. I was just searching dichotomy. IDM foundations for a, for a bonded triad that had the word so, certain in it and I couldn't find it. So I was trying, okay. So I was actually going to about to go through the document myself to, f to do that as well, to see if I could find a bonded triad with the word certain in it so that I could, you know, try and activate and resolve this dichotomy. So when Adrian started speaking, I got a little bit more, I think I got a little closer to what, what I think a res resolving third. So, um, I'm just going to try and take a stab at it. Um, so I'm going to use the bonded triad uh, the, the, uh, to ground the one that I'm going to try and make. I'm going to use the one to ground it is the simplicity, complexity, clarity tri um, bonded triad because simplicity and complexity are also are in are also opposites, just like certainty and uncertainty. Mm. So, um. I kind of feel like the certainty would be more like the simplicity. I feel like the uncertainty would be more of the complexity. And I don't know what the third would be. Um, That would be more like the clarity. So the, the closest I could come would be something like John Verbeke's notion of relevance realization. So like that's, that's great. I was, I was thinking of something. I was thinking the same thing. Something with movement and perception is what I was right. Something yeah. that tells you enough to which direction to move in, but isn't final. Exactly. So I'm thinking like of a compass. 
like a something um, that could approximate like a, um, a compass, but it, you have to hold it all together in order for it to serve that way. Like a fo think of it like a focusing mechanism. So mm -hmm. like um if you have something that is absolutely s certain, it's 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 a, a closed system that we can know everything about, so it's therefore simple, right? Something yeah. that is um, uncertain would be complex. There would be, it's not closed. There's dynamic to it. There's unknowns. There's things we cannot anticipate for. That would be, you know, the link between uncertainty and complexity. And the third that resolves the dichotomy of simplicity and complexity is clarity. So I'm thinking that the resolution to the uncertainty, certainty dichotomy that Adrian like so nicely brought out of like how we can lean to one, either one side and still be, um, still be an error or still be, um, mistaken or self-deceived mm -hmm. uh or ill-equipped to deal with whatever the situation is because we're too certain about it or we become um basically useless because we we're we're too uncertain so i think that the third has to be something like like a relevant realization what about mm -hmm. the word focus you said the word I focus earlier so certainty, uncertainty, uncertainty, and focus, and focus, and and relevance realization would be undergirding the focus. Is there a word? Is there a synonym to focus that feels less? Um, that that's more. Stability keeps coming to mind, but that doesn't make sense in light of what you said that it has to have movement because I don't see stability as being movement. Right. Yeah. Focusing. Can, you... can I riff off of what you're saying there, Nick? Please, please help. What, so what came to my mind was actually um, the Socratic concept of virtue. So virtue is something that's more in the middle, right? So, so if you were to take certainty and uncertainty, the virtue of certainty would be somewhere in the middle. So to be very uncertain of everything, that would be not virtuous. To be dogmatically certain about everything would be also not virtuous, but but somewhere in the between there. So like the possibility space that we kind of talk about on this channel, that that type of thing. So there, that's where the virtue of it would be if, if we apply Socrates to it. So I don't, I don't know the word necessarily, but it, it's that concept that I think we're trying to find. I'm thinking the word priority too. Like there's something like relevance realization. The only problem with it is that it's two words. <laughs> um, yeah. Priority relevance realization is you're prioritizing something based on an aim. So think and of you think aiming, of Whitehead. You're think aiming of because Whitehead. you're focused on something. So there's maybe maybe there's a bonded triad between um priority, relevance, and focus. And then hmm. think of Whitehead with prehension. And yeah. then think of think of like the third between certainty and uncertainty as apprehension. Could it be something relational? Hmm. Like it, it, yes, it has to be relational. Yeah, right. it has to be relational. It has to be conjugate. While Skep I'm here, skepticism. I... Sorry. No, go ahead. I was saying skepticism. That's just another word mm. for uncertainty, in a way, isn't it? Mm. While I'm here, you got like search for this third. The thing that keeps coming up to me, and I don't know how applicable this is, so help me think through my own thoughts, but I keep thinking about Ecclesiastes 3, where it says, you know, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to cry, there's a time to weep, there's a time to rejoice. And so I don't know if there is necessarily a third, but if it's more about discerning where does certainty exist and where does uncertainty exist? Like having the ability to identify what is certain 
and what is not certain. And then, okay, when we're in this space of uncertainty, what are our instructions for navigating the unknown? So I don't know, like I said, I don't know how relevant this is, but this is what was coming to me while you guys were, you know, throwing around different ideas. Like, I don't think it's either or, and I don't think there's a third. I think it's about discerning the times and the seasons and rightly dividing and identifying. Discern discernment is relevance realization. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's the third then. It's about the third. Assessment. <laughs> Yeah. So discernment seems like 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 the the incision between the certainty and the uncertainty. Hmm. I mean, there is no necessity to this. Like it it's definitely not necessary that we do this. <laughs> um <laughs> it's it's more more of like a serious kind of play, you know? Um I think I'm kind of ready to between well, certainty so, and uncertainty. Somebody said possibility space too. So poss possibility and potentiality is anyway, go ahead, Kyle. Well, in between certainty and uncertainty for me in practice is contemplation. It's, it's where I wrestle with the, the haves. It's like, oh, if, yeah, 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 if yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a tug of war contemplations, the flag, that marks which which side is is winning and um there's a there's a struggle uh between the two to me that's contemplation it's the rope yeah so if we use the um the the symbol of the dao or whatever and we have certainty as order and uncertainty as chaos well, then like the, yeah. the thing that's in the middle the yin -yin. where you want to be is um a foot in both. Yeah. You want to okay. straddle the line. Like if you're if you're all the way in one or all the way in the other, uh doesn't Peterson say something like this? Like mm -hmm. there's a there's a balance in having there's a dynamism a, to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um because you're not like in one sense, uh you're not so wild that you're all in the risk side of the equation, but there's also not a uh, fear where you're in the safety side of the equation. There's there's a balance of both. Mm -hmm. There's a saying in engineering that it's the business of of compromise. If you if you totally idealize one element of, of what you're needing to construct, then it you make it you, you make the other ones horrible, right? And mm -hmm. I think as man, we tend to want to put things in buckets, and God created most things on a spectrum. And so you have to balance, hence my, my engineering reference, you have to balance all those things out and navigate that spectrum. You can't just be over here or over here. The world doesn't actually work that way. <laughs> That's a good word. So Kurt had his hand up a few minutes ago, and I don't know if he got out what he wanted to say, but he just disappeared. Sorry. <laughs> grabbing a charger um yeah so i was wrestling with uh an analogy um kind of giving like a three thousand foot view on Derek webb it has to do with uh if you were to think of like a post-apocalyptic scenario right zombie apocalypse nuclear apocalypse whatever something like that and you get a civilization let's say that that paradise that one place that's perfect that's a refuge for everybody then there's people who were born there as time goes on. And then legend starts creeping in. So the reality of the outside world, outside of the civilization, might start to change, as well as the origins of that civilization. Then you have people who are born outside of the civilization, right? The wasteland, whatever you want to call it. They're maybe searching for this civilization. And when they finally get there, they kind of know all the outside world, the different things that are there because they experienced it. And then you have the people born there who since they haven't experienced it, they only know kind of what they've been told. And so if you're 
looking at Christianity in that way. It's it's a civilization, but it's had a lot of time to grow and expand, but also has kind of kept in this isolation. And metastasize, and metastasize, yeah. So what Derek Webb was in is like this distorted reality, the stories, the legends, the things like that of what what it is, what the origins of this place is, as well as what are the other, what's the outside like. And now he's curious to go explore on the outside. But then at the same time, somebody coming from the outside, if they came into it, they could kind of tell you, well, this is what the outside is like. <laughs> like, it's not that, not that great. There's a lot of bad things. And I'm glad I finally found this. But they might have a just a different perspective because of what they went through on that on, in that wasteland. So it's kind of these two conflicting perspectives. And mm. um, yeah, I think there's just that there's a lot of legend and stuff in the in the civilization or the sanctuary, whatever you want to call it. But hopefully you guys can maybe riff off of that idea, but it just kind of struck me. Um, did y'all listen to that sermon? I can't remember who posted it. I think maybe Kyle posted it a while back about somebody was preaching about the uh, settlers versus the colonizers. And it kind of reminded me of that. How, I mean, not the settlers, the common, what was it? The Unsettling um, the Settlers. What it's, was a Bre it? it's a Brennan Manning uh, sermon. Yeah. What was the name of the people that were out there? The uh, They are the um the trail oh, the trail people yeah the trail trail the pioneers boss. the pioneers. pioneers and the settlers yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the pioneers are familiar with the land they they are a, they have attunement with what is really out there in reality and the settlers have kind of shielded themselves off from from what's out there in reality and they they lose the ability to be in attunement with it and so the Christianity that we have available to us today is this sheltered enclave that is out of touch with reality. Something like that. Makes sense, Kurt. Yeah, no, that, that is. And I remember that sermon too was Kyle posting it, but yeah, it, it's kind of like that. Um, and I just think also it's, there's, there's an aspect of the cautionary thing because of what, what's really out there. There's, I mean, I, I guess from my perspective, I come because I, I came to Christianity late in life. So I did a lot of my exploring already. My, my exploring eventually led me to Christianity. Does that make sense? As opposed to if you're, if you're born in the civil, if you're raised that way, then you're kind of kept in the sheltered thing without exploring and you don't really know what that is. And so, so I think, I, I don't know 100% with Derek Webb, but I, think he mentioned he was kind of raised in it right yeah, yeah, yeah I, find, I find new converts to christianity very refreshing and, and not ideological converts i find i find them very refreshing james could the and i was gonna say analogy really could the story of the life of solomon kind of be kind of what you're a picture of what you're trying to describe kurt when he when he was raised as a son of david but yet you know and raised in that of david being um, a man after god's own heart if you will but yeah he had to go through a lot a time of life at a, um an awakening awakening if you will or a, a transformation in life of where there was you know he he did exploring he did um the um the phases in life of searching out and when he comes back then and he, he gives the conclusion of all that, if you will, of, um, and so I just, th and, and, but there was wisdom he learned through that. I mean, it talks about, um, through all the, the, um, through all of the events of his life. So like Sol Solomon isn't writing a uh, statement of faith based off the Torah. He's not Correct. writing the Talmud. He is going out and looking at everything under the sun and then bringing that back in yes, and gathering. Yes. So yeah, it's a really good point when you say it that way. Yeah. And perhaps 
there should be a component where we are doing something similar where, and it kind of ties back into what Derek, the first set of comments that we looked at last week with Derek Webb is like, just things coming out of the Bible isn't what makes things Christian or, but I can actually go out in the world and I, as a Christian perceiving those things can, can decide what kind of uh, certainty, uncertainty, and relevance, focus, discernment, or priority or contemplation they might have? And, and if you look, if you look at the civilization aspect of it, let's say somebody, somebody at some point they got really curious, they started asking a bunch of questions about the outside world, and they left, but then like maybe they never came back. So then what happens is because of that occurrence. People start making up a story about, oh, well, this is what it's like. At the, and they start distorting it to to keep that from happening again. And then that kind of builds on itself. So I kind of feel like that, in a way, that happens in Christianity. And it's even into denominations and different things. And so that there's this aspect of like being worried about people leaving. And so you fabricate things to kind of keep them in the box. You think you're protecting them, and then you're lying at the same time. Oh, the whole protection what? thing. Well, the whole safety thing. How, what, what's going to protect if people think their statement of faith is keeping them safe and protecting them from something? <laughs> it's making you vulnerable. Well, it's keeping it's, them from doing any good for it, Christ. It's an absolute back door for anyone who wants to hack you. Because now, now all I have to do is mimic my hack after what you already accept as a template, and I've got you. Yes, it's Christian music. That'll be nineteen ninety five plus shipping and handling, please. <laughs> so when you brought up the uh, the Brennan Manning sermon, um, I go back to that pretty pretty often. It's the folks out on the trail, the pioneers that are developing skills that are uh, kind of mapping the terrain and, you know, God forbid, but what if, what if the town burns down? Hmm. The, the settlers, yeah. the settlers are going to need some pioneers that know the land. That's right. Yeah. Um, and it seems like the more we huddle in these these settlements in modern Christianity, mm. the fewer and fewer and fewer of us uh, that know the land, that can do any so, good when things come falling down. Notice yeah. we're using the word pioneer. I didn't mean to shut somebody off, uh, whoever else was talking, but notice we're using the word pioneer, which was also used by Derek Webb, but not we're not using it because he used it. We got there through some other way, but now we're talking about pioneering. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? How we both wind up at the same place? Yeah, I'm I'm really super loving this uh, settler versus pioneer, um, you know, uh, characterization. I'm gonna I'm gonna take this all the way home, um, and overuse it constantly. Because um, I love all of the narrative implication that a settler versus a pioneer, what it what it um, what it infers. A settler is, I'm sorry, a pioneer is is so much more agentic, more powerful, um, and not necessarily more virtuous or moral necessarily um but there it just feels like the pioneer can do all the things that a settler can't um right, where right. a pioneer is also a micro settler because in order to go in, out into the unknown in into the into the west um he has to know how to settle for the night how to become secure um with, with a campfire and protect himself from the elements and from the predators and different things like that so he has he already has all the skills that a settler might have 
except for maybe the virtue of temp temperance. You know, a, a settler might have a much more a much higher tolerance for consistency. Um and mm. you know, you know what I'm saying? So there's a virtue in 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 that. Um but um I'm loving it. I want to be a pioneer. Yeah. yeah. Think, so I'm I think saying. Adrian, you were gonna say something a second ago, Adrian. Yeah, this conversation, this turning point is so good. The contrast between settlers and pioneers. Kevin, I remember a video you did like two years ago talking about Abraham and how Abraham was a pioneer. And then uh, backing off of what Kevin, I mean, off of what Nick just said, there is a way in which pioneers can become settlers, but I don't think that that's God's intent. And I think that's why the Bible says we go from faith to faith, oh, from wow. the glory, to be in a continual pioneering mode and mindset. Yeah. Because when you settle down, you start to develop constructs and the constructs are beneficial in the beginning, but as you continue to develop to develop constructs, you start to deviate from the fundamentals, like the foundational truths. And now you're building all of these things that have nothing to do with the truth. That's why a lot of these Christians are deconstructing their faith because they're identifying, like Derek Webb says, you know, not every book in a Christian bookstore is actually Christian. They're identifying all of these false constructs. And so I think that God desires for us to be pioneers, to constantly be agile in the way that we live our lives, because that is what allows us to stay away from the pitfall and the trap of developing those false constructs. Because when, when you're starting new, you always have to build on principles. You always have to lay a foundation. And so you can't deviate too far from the basic truths because am I making sense? You're <laughs> yes. making so much 100%, sense. I wanna, keep going. I, I want to jump on that, Adrian, where you this whole concept of moving from faith to faith because a pioneer will settle down a little bit enough to make a tent. Yeah. And yeah. then they're back up and going again. Yeah. And so a lot of like the settlers, they they do their project, they build the ark like Noah, and then they stop. There's nothing else to do. And then they get sodomized by their son when they're drunk, you know? And that, <laughs> so, so, I mean, the Bible's a wild book. And so what I'm what I'm instead of building the ark and stopping, what's the next thing? You know, yeah. move from faith to faith. And like Jordan Peterson defines faith is like moving forward moving towards something with incomplete knowledge about what that thing is moving yeah. forward in the face of uncertainty it's in the not, best. Yeah. The best part about um, quoting that, I think it's Romans um, one seventeen. It's like the best part about that is get the whole verse for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to mm. faith. Mm. Right. So That's in order to, in order to have to, in order to actualize the righteousness of God, it's 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 merely walking through that process that Adrian just you know characterized in the in the life of the pioneer. This is how the pioneer is, you know. I love that Me it too. comes right out of that verse. Well, and here what I'm fun? thinking about when you're talking about pioneers and settlers is that, and and maybe somebody can take this and elaborate on it better than I can. We don't have no of, time, but. Go ahead, James. <laughs> when I think of the uh, the difference between settlers and pioneers, it makes me think of the picture of those, if you will, put whatever group you want to is, is but we consider them the pilgrims that came to try to establish something here, but they weren't familiar with the land. They weren't familiar with the the um, the seasons as as yeah. they are so rough. We're on the east coast in the winter, and yet they had to submit themselves and rely on the if you will the uh, natives the native indians or whatever however you want to describe them that could help them get some understanding and some wisdom on how to uh, safely and through the seasons adapt and adjust to be able to create a civilization that they was trying to do mm. yeah. 
my mind yeah. keeps going to software with what we're talking about, like using software versus writing code, like the constructs and the systematic theology is kind of learning the software. Like I mentioned with science, you got to learn what's known. It's like learning a lot of facts, but at some point you want to transition what you're talking about exploring and pioneering is more writing code. And that's where I go back to the, the in an agile methodology too, not waterfall. Yeah. Right. And, and that structure is somewhat good because my, what my mind first went to, to, to software is because of the expression garbage in, garbage out. When you're in that exploring, when you're in that writing mode, it's more dangerous. And so you have to have some bounds of what your what your goal is and what you're exploring for, because whatever you're aiming towards, you'll probably end up close to it. Yeah. Well, and the your minimum and the, viable product. The difference between a uh, pilgrim and a pioneer is that the pilgrim's goal is actually religious and moral in its nature. A pilgrim is a person who goes on a pilgrimage, which is a religious, a religiously and morally motivated endeavor where the pioneer, what is the pioneer's motive? It's not necessarily religious. It's not necessarily um, moral. It's probably something more like um, natural or um, instinctual, or I, I don't even know. A pioneer doesn't have that that um, the constraint of that that like morally narrow goal. Like a pilgrim is, you know, constrained by the moral bounds of religiosity in their goal setting. Where a pioneer is like, correct. A pioneer can is cross domain. Is, is, yes, because they lived off the yeah, land. Very interesting. Doesn't every pioneer grow up a settler? Like, even if their parents are pioneers, their parents have created a settled structure for them. Right, mm -hmm. a, a place for them to springboard off of. You guys, well, I would is... see the yes, I would see the pilgrims or people like that. But but those that like were the Indians or the natives. I mean, they roamed all over the country, all over the all over the continent, and lived off the land. I mean, took what came as it came. I mean, they had uh, extraordinary um, expansion of, of how they uh, handled what they faced daily. They were patriarchal, agrarian hunter-gatherers. <laughs> Some of the pioneers were. There's a show, 1883, which is a spinoff from Yellowstone, which uh, would really burn in a good image of what a pioneer would be back then. Um, yes. we're over time. Okay. Adrian, it sounds like you're trying, you're burning to say something. Let's, let's hear I, it. One last thing. So my parents are Jamaican immigrants and I'm the first generation born in this country. So they pioneered and they came to America and they did the whole traditional, you know, go to school or go to trade school, get a nine to five, work for 40 years, retire. So they pioneered and then came into America and became settlers. And so then I followed their pattern. So I went to school, got a nine to five, did the traditional thing, blah, blah, blah. So then I decided that, you know what, I'm going to step out on faith. I'm going to try being self-employed. So I got my real estate license. And when I tell you my dad is like having heart attacks every single day of his life. And I'm just like, I only even exist because you pioneered. And now that I don't want to settle anymore and I want to pioneer, you're telling me to settle. You wouldn't even have the life that you had if you had not gone out into the unknown. And so you're telling me not to go out into the unknown. And you went into the unknown and it was greater than what you knew. What if I'm stepping out into the unknown and it's greater than what I knew that I inherited from you? So you guys are just talking about my life right now. Yeah, but it's a good springboard. Third, yeah. Pioneering is the third between certainty and uncertainty. Just mm. tell your tell your dad he set a good example. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, say thanks to the super. There's another super chat here. Just want to say thanks for Richard Vonderhaar real quick. Uh, pointing out a few passages of scripture here. Looks like some of them are about uh, faith and moving out and separating from things. If I had to guess. But uh, thanks for that, and also for the super chat from one day. All right. Are we, are we ready to close off this evening? 
I, I would wanna... request that yeah. you should try to have him on your channel. Derek? Yeah. I mm. thought about that. I thought about that. I'm still thinking about that. I kind of want to get Jordan Hall on here first, but <laughs> if I can. Because Jordan, I don't know if y'all know this, but Jordan Hall is the person that opened my eyes to Ephesians 4.16. And he did so back in 2019. And he has no idea that he did this. He has no idea that you, all of us are meeting right here, right now, because of him. Before he was a professing Christian. Before he was a professing Christian. Wow. And now I'm, I was afraid that him, because of all the versions of Christianity that we know of are pathological, I... I was afraid that, that we would lose something good that we had in Jordan Hall when he became Christian. And um, so far, it does not seem like that's the case. <laughs> All right. Uh, Y'all want to carry on this with next week? Keep doing this? You guys are amazing. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I uh, I think everybody said something tonight. That's good. It's awesome. All right, guys. Thanks so much for participating and everybody out there. Thanks for watching. Thank and you. uh 